Welcome to the AMA Innovations in Medical Education webinar, How to Incorporate Learners in Telehealth and Counting. We would like to introduce your host for today's webinar, Dr. Maya Hamoud. Dr. Hamoud serves as a Senior Advisor for Medical Education Innovations for the AMA. She is also Associate Chair for Education, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and Professor of Learning Health Sciences at the University of Michigan Medical School. I will now turn it over to Dr. Hamoud. Dr. Hamoud. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, obviously, telehealth use has increased significantly over the last year due to COVID-19 pandemic, and we do know that it's not going away, which is good. And But I think that one of the biggest challenges has been how to actually integrate learners into that environment. While we are really uh, good at integrating them in the physical clinical environment, the participation of students and trainees as part of the established workflow also in telehealth is important. Uh, so at the end of this webinar, we hope that you'll be able to, next slide please, consider strategies to incorporate health, telehealth as a core element of the clinical curriculum at your institution, describe the typical flow of a telemedicine encounter and point at which learner can be engaged, taught, and assessed. Discuss key faculty development needs to promote active teaching, including assessment and feedback during such encounters. Now, I would like to introduce you to today's speakers and remind you that the views of the presenters are their own and don't necessarily reflect those of their institutions or any other presenter or their respective institution. Uh, Dr. Heather Billings is the Director of Faculty Development at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Sciences, where she leads an interprofessional team of educators and instructional design specialists to create, facilitate, and assess faculty development programming across the enterprise. She is the AMC GME Central Region Chair, is an active member of the Generals for Medical Education, the Central Group on Educational Affairs, and the Online Learning Consortium. Dr. Julian Jenkins is a first year clinical informatics fellow at Stanford Healthcare. He has a background in computer science, electronic health record development, training, and medical education. His interest in telemedicine stems from his experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, and he's working on ways to improve telehealth training at UME and GME levels and plans to practice primary care with both in-person and virtual components. Dr. Vimal Mishra serves as the director of digital health at the American Medical Association and a medical director an associate professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. He provides clinical strategic research and informatics leadership to AMA Digital Health and VCU Health programs focused on electronic medical record, telehealth and augmented intelligence, as well as clinical decision support tools and other evidence-based digital health solutions. Dr. Uh, Rick Van Eck is Chair in Medical Education Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences, where he plays a leadership role in curriculum evaluation, education scholarship, and faculty development. He is a PI on the AMA Innovation Grant and on the AMA Accelerating Change in Medical Education Consortium Projects into Professional Telemedicine Simulations and Gamification for Competency-Based Medical Education. I'm very happy to welcome all our presenters today, and we thank them for their time. But before we begin, we'd like to know who is actually in our audience today. If you can just take a second here to fill out this poll for us. Thank you. And as you're doing this, I just want to remind you that as the presenters are presenting, please feel free to type any questions you have in the Q&A. Um, uh, box and we will try to address as many questions as possible uh, at the end of the presentation. We will be leaving time for Q&A. And, a. and um, I see here that we have a nice uh, diversity of uh, attendees. Uh, we welcome everyone and we hope that you will find this uh, useful. And now I would like to pass it on to Dr. Uh, Rick Van Eck. Thank you, Dr. Hamoud. Uh, so we're going to talk to you, uh, next slide please, we're going to talk to you uh, about several things today as Dr. Hamoud has alluded to. Uh, we are, uh, the presenters today as well as some other folks are working on a telehealth education playbook which is uh, kind of an outgrowth of the previous playbook that was done for clinical settings for clinicians. There are multiple contributors to that, and uh, there's obviously a lot of detail that's going to go into that, 12 different steps covering all aspects of planning, training, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, we're in the first draft of that now, and final publication is anticipated 
in September. So keep your eyes uh, open for that. There'll be lots more detail. But today, what we wanted to do is just share some of the highlights uh, that stood out for us, particularly through the lens of the four quadrants of telehealth training. And you're going to learn a little bit more about those uh, from our next presenter. And uh, after that, we'll see how those apply to both the student perspective of telehealth education, clinical perspectives, uh, the curriculum design perspective, and the faculty development perspective, all through the lens of these different four quadrants. So we hope that'll generate a lot of interest and questions so that we can talk about this and we'll be happy to share our perspective. Next slide. Great, Rick, thank you so much. And uh, like Maya said, my name is Julian Jenkins. I'm a fellow in clinical informatics uh, at Stanford, newly minted within the past month, and then was previously an internal medicine resident at UCSF, where I had the most experience with uh, telehealth education and telehealth training. Um, happy to be with all of you today. Really thrilled to get to talk about this subject again. You know, we uh, addressed this about a year ago through the AMA with, I think, a similar um, uh, focus, but just with a different uh, range of experience and, and the whole year behind us, I think there's a lot of exciting things that have changed and, and um, new, new perspectives to have. Uh, just as a roadmap for my 10 minutes with you all, I'm going to be starting with some background to kind of reminding us everybody where we are um, in the pandemic in telehealth training and in telehealth. And then uh, I'm going to introduce the four quadrants, which some of you may already be familiar with from our previous uh, AMA telehealth webinar. And then uh, finally, I'll just share some training perspectives. So um, knowing that my, my limitations as a, as a uh, panel member are, uh, I'm GME focused, uh, I practice primarily adult care, and really I'm a, I'm a trainee first and, and, a, and a clinician second. So uh, I hope my perspective is useful. Next slide, please. So let's start with just the question, where are we now? Um, yeah, it's been 18 months of, I think, what I would qualify as intermittent virtual clinical education, undergraduate and graduate level medical education. Um, we've been trying things. Uh, some of this is evidence-based, some of this is trial and error. And what have we learned? Uh, next slide, please. I think one thing that's remarkable and we're all feeling is a light at the end of the tunnel that, that the, you know, medical students are back, our, our trainees are back in clinic, in person. Um, and, and some of those familiar models of clinical education that we really, uh, are, we're, we're, you grew up with and familiar with, and we ourselves are trained in, uh, are accessible again. Um, some semblance of normalcy has returned. Next slide, please. But the reality is that telehealth is here to stay. Um, this is just one example. I thought it was a nice visualization from a McKinsey um, report on the current state of telehealth. And uh, you know, not knowing exactly the relative nature of this, you can see relative to telehealth prior to the pandemic in February of 2019, we have a sustained 38x increase in claims data oriented around telehealth. So how that relates to telemedicine, I don't know, but I think this just shows graphically the sustaining nature of the change in uh, the, the usage of telemedicine across uh, uh, the entire um, healthcare industry. And I think that this says to me that telehealth is here to stay and we have to, as, as, as educators, think about how to incorporate this in, tel you know, in, in intentionally into our uh, education and curriculum. Next slide, please. The other thing that I think is really remarkable is these are just you know, silly screenshots taken from PubMed searches, but what this is demonstrating, the top uh, screenshot shows the change over time in number of articles represented on PubMed when you search for telemedicine or telehealth. And so obviously there's the modern era when this actually started to exist, when you see this slow trend, and then you see this incredible spike in 2020. Right, and that's what's highlighted there. We have 8,000 articles and already in July of 2021, we're beyond 50% of the number of, of publications associated with these keywords. And then when you scoot down, if you look on the bottom uh, screen, screenshot, you see when you add medical education onto that search term and obviously not syst system um, systematic approach toward this uh, uh, process, but you can see how uh, education and interest in telehealth education uh, has really spiked. And so what this means for us is that there's a lot more information and uh, uh, opportunities to explore what people have already done, evidence, and really make informed decisions on how we're gonna redefine curriculum moving forward. Next slide, please. So just to walk back and kind of feel nostalgic for a second, in June 29th, 2020, it was when we had the first AMA Innovations webinar on, on medical edu education, peri-pandemic, and this rapid transition to virtual 
clinical education. And you can see, we, I think we really focus on the idea of emergency remote teaching. What can you do now? What can you take and just let's get the learners back into the clinical world. Their, their, their clinical care isn't progressing. Their, their clinical skills aren't progressing. How can we just bring them back in? And uh, next slide, please. Now, a year later, we have the tools and the experience to maybe begin to think about intentional curricular design. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna introduce the four quadrants as a way to frame that. Next slide, please. So the four quadrants are something that myself and uh, my colleague, Benjamin Lee, who uh, was a medical school classmate of mine, and then we were both residents at UCSF together. Um, he is a resident in radiation oncology. I'm a resident in internal medicine. So we had a, a, a sort of opposing experiences in uh, telemedicine, one in specialty care and one in general primary care myself. Um, how we thought about uh, building a framework to categorize ways that you can enhance clinical training uh, for your learners. The way we like to phrase this was, these are four levers, levers that you can pull to improve the telehealth clinical training experience for your learners. So, so think of these as different ways that you can manipulate the environment or the experience to enhance learning. So just to walk through these, uh, next slide, please. The first is optimize logistics, next slide. The second is build skills, next slide. The third is facilitate learning, next slide. And the last is to innovate. So I'm gonna go through these each individually. Next slide. So the first one of optimized logistics, this is to focus on what can you do to really reduce the extraneous cognitive load and create uh, this, this nurturing functional learning environment. What that means functionally is to, to how can you minimize all of those things, the hardware, the internet connections, uh, expectations, all of the sort of framework and scaffolding and, and, and everything that your clinical uh, virtual clinical encounter is built on top of that you don't really need the learners to be engaging with. You want it to be streamlined. You want them to jump into that virtual clinical encounter and be learning just like they're opening a door into an exam room. Uh, next slide. Uh, building skills is talking about the idea of actual clinical telemedicine skills, right? Acknowledging that this is a different subset of clinical skills, similar, and they're shared a uh, shared foundation for a lot of the skills that we're using in virtual clinical encounters and telemedicine, but that there is a different set of skills that we need to focus on and teach in, knowing that there are people that are going to practice predominantly telemedicine and that you need to think about this environment differently, uh, not just as a virtual replication of the in-person clinical training environment. Next slide, please. Third, we talk about facilitating learning, and this is separate, and so I'll take just a second to separate this from building skills. And this is the idea that just like there was this transition from in-person learning, clinical learning, pre-clinical learning, changing the classroom from that in-person experience to that, the virtual experience and seeing all the different ways that that impacted our learning. Um, the same thing goes for the virtual clinical encounter. So what tools, what uh, approaches you might have as a preceptor in a virtual, in an in a in-person clinical space may require changing or complete revision um, in, in a virtual space. And similarly for learners, to learn how to learn differently in this virtual environment and understanding that there are certain affordances uh, of the virtual clinical learning space that are different from the in-person space. Next slide, please. And finally, innovation. And this is in some ways the foundation to everything, but the idea that, that telemedicine is here to stay, it's new, it's different, but it's not bad. It's, it's this exciting opportunity that we have to really incorporate this new mode of delivering care uh, into our training as physicians, into our learning as educators, into our curricula, and then trying new and exciting ways to actually deliver education, leveraging the tools that uh, computer and technology offer. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna just briefly run through a few examples now uh, from the trainee perspective on what this looks like. Next slide. So optimizing logistics, just some things to highlight here would be thinking about an equitable setup. So knowing that your learners may not have an office that they can allocate for a virtual visit or may not have the technology or may have an, a, a less than adequate internet connection at home. Thinking about how can I eliminate those worries? Let's take that off their plate. Let's build a space for them in our, in our you know, medical school where they can come and engage in virtual encounters or let's provide laptops that have re reliable settings or how, let's help guide them and provide best practices for how to set up your home virtual workspace making it professional so you feel comfortable and engaged and are not thinking about, you know, oh gosh, look at what I see in the background of my camera and what are the patients thinking? What are my presenters thinking? The se second thing, and, and uh, Dr. Van Eck, I think will share a little bit more about this too, is setting clear expectations and the idea that, that 
uh, a lot of this without having those chance encounters and in-person uh, engagement, I'll talk about this a little bit more, you don't have the same opportunities for, for setting expectations, or at least the expectations aren't what we're used to. And so having pre-encounter um, pre huddles or somewhere where the, the preceptor and the student are engaging together to set expectations can be really helpful um, and allow us to answer and, and engage in questions that may not have come up naturally. Next slide, please. Building skills, I think this is the most straightforward to understand. And I wanna highlight, you know, one of the most classical things is the virtual physical exam being new, unique, different, right? The other thing I wanna highlight is uh, learning, thinking about digital nativism in, in two ways. You know, this being the idea that individuals born as, you know, in the millennial generation or later are natively comfortable with technology. And I think the reality with this is that may be true. That also may be a dangerous assumption. So helping to assess somebody's comfort, don't assume that level of comfort and, and guiding them if they're not comfortable with the technology, um, but also being open to ideas from, that, uh, from this generation of people that have such facility and such experience with technology. Next slide, please. But, uh, third, I wanna talk about facilitating learning. And this is, again, I think fairly intuitive once you separate these two out. This is the idea of, uh, so one example, when you're educating in a virtual environment, it's much easier to fall back on the observer rule, to think about yourself as just watching. And so this requires, necessitates uh, a higher degree, a greater frequency of interactivity. So don't do your best in those virtual clinical spaces to bring the learner in. It, it, it may be much harder to do that naturally. You can't just have the auscultation at the bedside, the natural, you know, what questions do you have, uh, the, the learners jumping in. They may, they may be sort of retreating to this observer role and you as a facilitator can really pull them out with interactivity. And the second thing is creating back channels. Again, I think the other panelists will touch on this, but this is the significance of having a way to communicate uh, behind the scenes, to share learning points for questions that may not be as, as easy when you don't have those chance hallway encounters or kind of the after clinic uh, chance uh, interactions when you're in person. And next slide. And finally, innovation. And I just wanna share one concept within innovation, which I think is dear to my heart, is the idea of co-creation and really engaging the learners early, engaging your trainees, the people that are, that are absolutely stakeholders in this environment to, to help I, to ideate with them, to produce curricula together, to think about what they see import, as important, what their deficits are, what you might need to optimize, what skills they're lacking. This is sort of, in some ways, an anchor point and a linchpin for this entire framework, but just being creative and having a mindset and an openness uh, to uh, uh, innovation within the space of telehealth training. Next slide, please. So in summary, you know, those are some examples from a trainee perspective. I think the focus here is thinking about these four quadrants as a framework to help guide intentional curricular design at all stages of the curricular lifestyle cycle. Next slide, please. Specifically to think about assessing needs designing curriculum and gathering feedback along these quadrants. And the rest of the panelists will share a lot more perspective and bring this together along using the four quadrants as a shared framework. Next slide, please. I just wanted to highlight two uh, resources that uh, uh, I think are worth reviewing. Um, one is this article from uh, some of my colleagues or former preceptors and mentors at UCSF focused on best practices for medical student integration and telehealth visits. And the second are the double AMC telehealth competencies as sort of a more sy systematic way to approach developing a curricula. And, and the panels, other panels will talk more about that now. Next slide, please. I just wanted to thank uh, all my co-presenters, Dr. Mahmoud, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, presentation and the AMA, of course, for ongoing support. And now I will happily turn it over to Dr. Vimal Mishra uh, for more on the preceptor's perspective in the telemedical, telemedicine training environment. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. That was incredible. Um, I really uh, saw the um, excitement in you and while you were kind of in your residency, taking it uh, on and, and making a better workflow was, was fantastic. So thank you for sharing some of the perspectives and the framework. So uh, as a clinician, as a, as a physician preceptor, um, this is new for us as well. Uh, before COVID hit, we were doing about less than 1% of telehealth, uh, of the visits which were telehealth. So it was more of a niche. And now this is a new perspective, a new way of delivering care. And, and when we start thinking about, uh, you know, a new way of delivering care, we are learning ourselves and we are in this uh, special place where we are learning ourselves. We are trying to master the skills of doing or delivering care using telehealth but we are also trying to engage our learners into 
into this, uh, this practice and also making sure that they are learning and they are helping us as well. So next slide, please. So as uh, Julian was talking about these four quadrants, optimizing logistics and facilitating, uh, facil facilitate learning, uh, innovating and, and uh, building skills, they kind of, uh, if you start thinking about how is it different as compared to our in-person visit right now, what are the, the delta uh, from thinking about what is the difference about the logistics of telehealth versus in-person? Uh, in person? We, we need to start thinking about the stages or the phases of the visit is the, let's go back to the pre-visit uh, period. So it's a pre-visit, it could be divided into two, the pre-visit where the scheduling is happening and how is the scheduling happening? What are the indicators that the scheduling is virtual? And uh, there, are, there, are, there have been instances where the patient is confused if, the patient, uh, if they are seeing the provider uh, virtually or in person. Um, also thinking about how does the arrival work? So if the patient gets on the uh, Zoom call, let's say a Zoom call, how does the patient interact with the provider? How does the patient interact with the patient? Thinking about the patient journey, the learner's journey, the provider's journey, and how do they interact with each other? Thinking about the real clinical encounter and what happens in the post-visit work. And I'll give you an example as how we do it here at Virginia Collins University. So the scheduling is uh, done at the same, uh, same um, office which does in-person scheduling. We do have something as a, a modifier so that provider and the student knows this is the patient which, which will be seen virtually. At the time of arrival, we then have the team roles and expectations very well defined in terms of what happens when the patient logs in, who gets alerted? Who welcomes the patient into this new environment of virtual waiting room? Now we are very used to. And what, what are the team, other team role mem um, members who work with us, the nurses? What is their role? What, what are the pharmacists, if there's a pharmacist? What are the language services? How do we interact with them and create this, uh, co-create this overall logistics, which will support learning and perceptorship? And, and uh, uh, also teaching the students. So moving from the, uh, and also the most important thing around facilitating learning is around creating that expectations for the learners as what they wanna learn. Thinking about, uh, thinking about you know, our present in-person visit where the learners first do the chart review. And, and then we have an expectation as to what the goal for the visit is. Doing the same for even for the uh, telehealth visit is also helpful. Thinking about, because telehealth visit is a little different as compared to in-person visit because the patient is not in front of you. And if the patient needs more support or less support, you have people around you so that you can deliver care to the patient or escalate care for the patients. But now in this new world, we are talking about where the patient might be in a, in a place where um, they're, they might be in danger. So how do we then start thinking about with the learners of creating this triage categories of, of green, yellow, and red? Hey, if this patient, patients who needs medication, uh, uh, you know, refills, or maybe just a follow-up visit for COPD or for CHF, yeah, that sounds good. The patient can be seen. But what happens if you start seeing the patient, you know, um, not doing well if there is some kind of emergency. So we need to have that triage categories and escalation plan very well uh, defined and thought through, uh, in, including that. Next uh, visit, please. Next slide, please. And, and as Julian was talking about new skills, because this is a new telehealth, this is, uh, there, there is a technology which is very different. For Zoom, there is a different kind of, um, uh, affordances, there are different uh, functionalities which might not be there for, let's say, WebEx. So how do we then think about building this competency to maximize the, or optimize the use of the technology being used? Uh, how do we now, talking from bedside manner to start thinking about website manner? How do we change that communication? How do we see in the camera? How do we then uh, create a, a, a connection with the patient? History taking, 80% of the diagnosis can be made by history taking. How do we then uh, uh, work with our students 
to really think about how can we do a better history taking. And, and uh, several times I've had patients, actually, I ask patients to show, hey, what's in your fridge if the patient is having issues with diabetes? You can now, a new way of seeing the patient's home, the environment, and maybe also, uh, you know, habits, what they're eating. So increasing, it increases the depth of history taking as well. And physical examination, again, we are just talking here, there are so many different modalities of telehealth. So we are just talking here in terms of virtual virtual visit, which is audio video visit, uh, because uh, the physical examination will not, if this is asynchronous visit, physical examination will not take place. But physical examination, if this is a direct to consumer um, virtual visit, you can ask the patient to, hey, can you touch below your, uh, below your neck? Do you feel uh, a, a mass or, or a lump? Uh, similarly, um, you know, if this is a hub and spoke telehealth model, you might be able to kind of communicate with the nurse, uh, nurse uh, at the patient bedside and ask them to do assisted physical examination for a stroke for assisted physical examination. And again, there is so much more of when you start thinking about what technology can do and how we can really optimize the use or of the technology to, you know, think about really getting the team based care together. So many team members might be at different places, but now with technology, they can come together. Thinking about the patient experience, how can we make sure that telehealth visit is one call um, and, and patient goes through the whole journey with one call without any interruptions and learner's experience as well, as Julian was talking about, how can we get the stakeholder together and create the curriculum together? And there's a lot more. Just want to also give you some of the innovation which we have done here at VCU as well in terms of uh, creating that waiting room, uh, having the nurses or the MAs do the medication reconciliation, then doing the warm transfer to the clinical room. There's a, several clinical rooms for each provider has been created, which, which is um, the breakout rooms. And there's a breakout room created for the students to interact with the uh, attending to talk about the patient. And where the attending can go back and join any of the breakout rooms to kind of talk about the, with the patient as well. So there are so many ways to innovate in this new environment of telehealth. Each, each of the points that I'm talking about can take an hour by itself, and there's a lot more coming with the, the uh, playbook we are working on. And uh, this is just a curtain raise. I just wanted to kind of talk through some of the key points and put it in the framework of these four quadrants. Um, and you will hear more from Dr. Van Vanek and Dr. Uh, Dr. Billing moving forward. Next, please. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. So um, you're starting probably now to see some commonalities across our presentations, and you'll hear some of me talk about some of the same things, but we're all doing so from a slightly different perspective. So uh, full disclosure, I am an instructional designer by training. I was a professor of instructional design for 15 years before I came uh, to the world of medical education. And I'm gonna share with you uh, my perspective on these uh, four quadrants and telehealth education design from the perspective of instructional design. And a big part of what I used to do uh, as a professor in that field is work with technology, uh, with uh, K-12 teachers on what we call technology integrations. And some of the precepts from that uh, are directly relevant to the way I think we can think about uh, telehealth education as opposed to telehealth encounters per se. Next, please. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Marshall McLuhan and his famous saying that the medium is the message. And there's been tons of debate about what he really meant by that. And it's been used in lots of different ways. But the way instructional designers think about this is the big picture is that when you have a message uh, and you have a medium, if you don't pay attention to the design of each of those, then you'll be putting square pegs in round holes. You have to align the two things. And so in our case for this metaphor, telehealth would be the medium and education is the message. And so the big picture is the message must conform to the medium. So what do we mean by that? Next, please. Well, a simple way to think about it uh, in the field of technology is when we had uh, music as, a, as vinyl records and we still have them, some of us still listen to those. 
Um, people would listen to them either over the radio, uh, where they'd be played one at a time, or they'd play them in their home, right? And somebody decided, wouldn't it be great if we had some technology that could play all kinds of music and people could just pick whatever they wanted to hear and play it and listen to it. So they invented the jukebox. Next. And lo and behold, when we try to put records together with a jukebox, it works perfectly because the technology is designed to support that particular uh, message, right? But then we get to the point where we developed uh, phones, smartphones and computers, and suddenly we wanted to listen to music there as well because they could do all kinds of things. They could store tons of music and so forth. Next, please. But obviously records don't fit well within that technology. So we had to digitize them. That's why we have lossless technology. That's why we have iTunes and, and all the others, right? Next, please. So if, if we think about uh, this in the context of telehealth first, uh, separate from telehealth education, telehealth is seeking the same health outcomes as we had with face-to-face -face using different methods. Now we've already talked about and you've heard that we can't do a perfect job of that, right? But we, the point is we're trying to achieve the same things where and when we can using a different method that accounts for that uh, medium. So imagine how successful we'd be if we had never adapted to the medium and insisted on doing everything via telehealth the way we did it face to face. Well, there'd just be things that couldn't be done, period, because you can't do them uh, if you're not present. Next, please. Another way to put it, which uh, I actually prefer, is, uh, is that you shouldn't blithwop your precepting. When it comes to telehealth education in an encounter, uh, those of you who are old enough, and we won't do a poll, so I won't embarrass you, but uh, old enough to remember Rich Hall and Saturday Night Live, he used to do these things called sniglets. And sniglets were words that he felt should exist for phenomena that we're all familiar with, but which did not. And one of my favorites is blithwopping, which is using anything but a hammer to hammer a nail into a wall. So what do we know about this? We know you can do that, right? But it's not ideal. It's not going to work in all the cases. Uh, and you may end up with uh, heel marks on the wall. There's all kinds of uh, negatives to trying to use uh, the wrong tool for the job. And the same is too for precepting or teleprecepting, if you will. So teleprecepting seeks the same learning outcomes using different procedures, right? So again, we have to adapt the medium and the message. We have to adapt our educational encounters to uh, the situation, the environment, the technology, and the approach that we have. Next, please. Well, one of the things that happens whenever you talk about technology, and certainly you're all familiar with this with, with telehealth because it came on so many, uh, so quickly without warning and without sufficient training and support. We immediately think of all the things we can't do, right? And these are what we call in my field barriers, technology barriers. So it takes longer to set up the technology. Uh, that's an extra step you have to do. We get technology breakdowns that interrupt the flow of things. There may be bandwidth issues where suddenly the screen freezes and we can't move any further. And even when we don't have a technology breakdown or problem, some things just take longer to do. Those of you that have done any kind of online learning, if you've participated in a threaded discussion board, yeah, we're achieving the results of a discussion, but it takes a lot longer. You've got to click on 12 things and hit reply and hit send and then think about what you're going to type. You can accomplish the same thing, but even when the technology works, some things just take longer to do. So that's definitely a barrier. But there's also barriers when it comes to the people that are involved, right? So even if uh, you or the preceptor and students uh, have been trained on telehealth, you may not have been trained in the same systems. You may have different metaphors for and models for what it means to do uh, telehealth. And so you could have the same training, which in many cases we don't have enough, but you also may not have um, consistent training that, that is aligned. Uh, and of course, with uh, patient support and access, we've talked touched a little bit on that, that it's, it, there are barriers involved there. Well, one of the big barriers that people sometimes don't think about is what we often call multitasking, but I would suggest and many others suggest is better characterized as task switching. Uh, the research is pretty clear that nobody actually multitasks. All they do is switch from one task to the other and some of them are faster at it than others. Um, and what that means is an important distinction because what that means is you're always going to have divided attention. If you're not truly multitasking, that means when you're paying attention to something, you are not paying attention to something else. You might be aware of it and trying to think of it, but your, you, your focus and your attention is on the one, not the other. And anytime you have divided attention, that's a potential barrier, that's a problem. And what it ends up doing with the technology load uh, 
uh, and the design of, of our telehealth platforms and others is you get increased what we call extraneous cognitive load, which is just stuff that's related to the technology. It just doesn't work or it's not designed well or an engineer built it and now you have to figure out how to use it. Uh, but it also uh, increases intrinsic cognitive load, which is the amount of um, cognition you have to devote to managing the technology itself, even when it's working, even if it's well designed, you have to pay attention to the technology as well as what you're trying to do. And by increasing those two levels of cognitive load, what you're re doing really is reducing germane cognitive load. And that's the cognition that we care the most about. It's what lets you be a good diagnostician. It's what lets you be a good problem solver. It's what lets you be a good listener and to interpret what a patient is saying. And so obviously the, the more we can do to reduce those first two, uh, the more capacity we have for the third. But it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a it's a problem that can't be fully solved. There's always a certain level of cost to involved with the telehealth and the technology. Next, please. But I want to talk to you about something that that you may not think a lot about with technology and that often doesn't come up. And it comes from this guy named Don Norman, who wrote uh, some really amazing books. One of the best design minds in uh, in modern times. The design of everyday things, invisible computing. His big idea was that technology and other things in our lives should be designed in a way that don't require training. They should suggest to you what you should do, when you should do it, and how you should do it. They should be easy to use, put more simply. Uh, well, my field in instructional design, we pulled from this the concept of technology affordances, which we place in opposition to technology barriers. And this is a really important concept to think about with telehealth uh, education, because if we only focus on the barriers, we'll just be thinking about what we can't do, can't do, can't do. Technology innovation, also allows us to do things we couldn't do. So yes, we have to change our procedures, but in some cases, those procedures can allow us to do things faster, better, or that we could not do at all in, in the past. So a technology affordance, if you wanna think about it, is um, the thing that a technology will allow for, suggest, or support in, in its use. And this both allows and requires new ways of behaving. So we have to think about both of these things. We want to minimize barriers and we want to maximize affordances. And that's the key to any technology, including telehealth, when it comes to education. Next, please. I'm not going to read this table to you, uh, but I wanted to just give you some big picture ideas about what might be involved when you're thinking about affordances and barriers. So we talked about um, whether there's a nurse present uh, or another health professional present where the patient is if you're not co-located with them. Well, you and the student and the patient may be located in three different places. It makes a difference whether you are together, which two of you are together, or whether all three of you are together, right? So um, if you are not in the same place and the telehealth platform supports this, which is um, obviously we know not always the case, you've got barriers like communication. So there's all kinds of um, body language and subtle cues and, and uh, little things that you can do and just quick little asides you can do that maybe in the, in the telehealth platform you can't because the communication is mediated by the technology. But at the same time, one of the affordances to being in different places is while one person is doing something, the other person can be doing something else that's in support of that. Let's say, well, I think there may be some, some current thinking on this, but you know, we can talk about some different ways that you can manage whatever it ends up being. And the student can be looking that up and sending that to the preceptor via back channel communication or, or otherwise. So there are both barriers and affordances to, for example, location. Next, please. There are also, and more importantly for our discussion, there are affordances and barriers that are due to the, that are part of the platform. So often email or something like it, asynchronous communication is available uh, to us in, in these encounters before the encounters. So one of the benefits of that is that you can communicate and assign tasks ahead of the encounter. Take a look at the patient list for tomorrow. I want you to find five things on such and such. We've got a case who's coming in and doing X, Y, Z find out what the latest thinking is on whatever it might be, okay? So there's some things that can be done and negotiated up front as, uh, as the others were talking about. Of course, there's also associated barriers because your timeliness of communication is a lot slower. So pluses and minuses. Um, the chat feature and what uh, uh, Julian referred to earlier as this back channel communication, this is a real affordance of technology if it's used well, uh, but it requires some planning. So. 
Now in, uh, in online learning, we used to worry as, as educators about students who were in the chat instead of paying attention to what was going on in class. But what the research has shown is that in most cases, the communication that goes on in the chat is in support of what's going on in the face-to-face -face, uh, environment. And what it does is it actually gets questions asked, answers, resources shared, uh, all kinds of things that don't interrupt the flow of the main encounter, but which are in support of it and which uh, uh, makes a more equitable learning uh, environment. So uh, you're going to um, see a little bit about the idea of a back channel communication uh, towards the end of our talk here. Next, please. So if you think about through the lens of what are the affordances and the barriers in people, in resources, in time, in location, in uh, the platform, the technology, you take both of those into account, then you can start building what we would uh, uh, advocate for as a template for what you expect out of an encounter. And you can assign the roles, you can negotiate those up front. In our playbook, we're making the assumption that it's a clinical setting. There's asynchronous communication and pre-work that is available to the encounter. There is both synchronous and asynchronous communication during the encounter. And there's an opportunity for a debrief, uh, synchronous or asynchronous after the encounter. Uh, next, please. Of course, you're going to need more than one template because your students will be diff differ, your patients will differ, your technology platforms might change, people will get better at these kinds of things, you will learn uh, how your encounters work and want to change them and modify them based on experience and multiple platforms, etc. Keep in mind uh, also that uh, I've been talking primarily here about the telehealth education, which is uh, in terms of the telehealth encounter. In other words, how to learn about medicine in the practice of telehealth, not about telehealth itself. The other side of that equation is telehealth education that specifically focuses on the skills that Julian referred to earlier. So again, the AAMC telehealth competencies are a key resource for you. We highly recommend that you consider them and use them when you're developing your curriculum. We built a phase three telehealth elective with the VA because we had a person who was interested who had access within the VA and it could be set up. Um, based on our analysis of access resources, the affordances and barriers, we developed objectives and linked them to the competencies in a very clear uh, document that we can share with others in our curriculum, which shows both students and preceptors what we expect of the students out of those competencies, but also helps us avoid redundancy because we're not uh, all developing uh, training around the same kinds of competencies. We can get good coverage that way. So I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Billings, who will share her perspective on faculty development with telehealth precepting. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Eck. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about faculty development considerations. Uh, next slide. So within any teaching hospital, a patient's experience and outcomes are dependent on the interactions they have with their care team. And that includes learners, of course. Sometimes the supervisor provides most of the impact and interaction, and at other times the learner or the trainee is more prevalent and independent. Fostering and providing a compassionate, caring connection through this emerging new normal that we've been talking about with the rising prevalence of telemedicine encounters can be really challenging. So how do we help and support our supervisors who themselves are learning the new normal as they teach and assess and share feedback and provide the right level of autonomy and supervision. Supervisors may need to be a bit more vulnerable as they assume the role of both the teacher, the clinician, and the learner. Next slide, please. So within any, or excuse me, so there are a number of situational factors to keep in mind when preparing for an effective educational encounter, as well as for the inevitable pivots during a patient telehealth visit. Sharing your own level of experience as a supervisor with telehealth fosters a reciprocal learning environment, whether telemedicine is relatively new experience for you or whether you've been doing this for a while. You may want to share to what extent your, this occurrence of televisits and your proficiency has evolved. So for example, you might share, I'm honing my skills as well to kind of level set. Or I used to do one of these a month and now they make up 70% of my calendar. 
ask, similarly asking a learner to share their own self-assessment, asking them what have your experiences been? Have you done this before with this type of parent, patient? What are your current gaps? Um, helps to you role model sort of what you're expecting of them and then you're inviting them to basically um, follow your, um, your approach. So taking time to review your schedule or your patient list with the learner, specifically which patients the learners should be sure to see and those they should maybe not necessarily prioritize. Review the sequence of the visits. Should they go in first, go in after your initial visit? What should the learner be doing in between visits? Be explicit. Discuss expectations, including roles and responsibilities of the other care team members. Um, sharing things like this is how we will work together. Make it clear what's required at the onset. I will do this, you will do that. They, the other members of the care team, uh, will be doing this. Share how the teaching and learning experience will be the same and how it may be different within a telehealth environment. With regards to learner levels, ask each learner to identify a couple learning objectives, specific knowledge, skills, attitudes that they would like feedback on and direct them to ask for this feedback after the encounter to take responsibility for doing so. Share with them what your specific knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, are that you'll be assessing. And this could include, of course, medical knowledge, diagnostic reasoning, procedural skills, communication skills, but also things such as empathy, responsiveness to feedback, or teamsmanship. How might these need to be modified or emphasized within the telehealth environment? A big part of balancing autonomy with supervision is fostering this type of self-reflection and assessment by the learner. And the next two slides uh, will provide a couple models to further illustrate this. Next slide. So this first one um, I find to be a helpful uh, reference. It was developed by Martin Broadwell a uh, management consultant and professional coach, actually. And I think it's quite descriptive though with what many of us have experienced during the last year and a half. It's the four stages of competence. In the first stage um, called unconscious incompetence, we just jump right in. Um, in, in my area of expertise, which is um, adult education, medical education, um, this is synonymous with the emergency remote uh, teaching and learning that happened in March and April of 2020. With a little duct tape and super glue, we just got it done. Then we transitioned to stage two, the conscious incompetence, where we were much more aware that we could do this emergency remote teaching and learning better. There were gaps that were identified, there were opportunities to improve, viable solutions were sought out and processes became more defined with an emphasis on building in quality and consistency. The third stage is sort of the sweet spot, this conscious competence, where we're now very discriminatory in our approach. We're striving toward excellence. We're taking deliberate actions. We know why we're doing certain things and have clear expectations for what that action is going to result in. We're focused on building exemplars, improving efficiencies and utility. And, and this is important. We're seeking to broadly disseminate what we have learned. So yes, I know this is hard, um, but we've put these practices into place. It's worth our time to learn it. It's worth our time to practice it. It's worth our time to assess it feedback and normalize it. The fourth stage is unconscious competence. And you would think that this is the ideal, uh, but it can also be a bit of a trap because this is where we just do it. Uh, it's hard to even recall 
all the minutia behind the decisions that were made to create this exemplar process. Uh, we can erroneously assume that others are just as aware of the processes, just as proficient in the methods as we are. And it almost becomes near impossible to articulate all those little steps of how to get to this effortless proficiency. So how does one progress through these stages? Bill Kutrayer, Martin Pusik, Larry Gruffin, and others have given us an excellent framework for medical education through which we might do so, called the Master Adaptive Learner Model. Many of you may be familiar with this, which includes a combination of more formal staged learning as well as self-regulated learning. Next slide, please. This model provides a framework for both learners and supervisors to be intentional and descriptive in their teaching and learning goals by promoting the planning of the educational encounter, that blue portion of the circle, the adoption of active learning attitudes and strategies during the clinical encounter, that green section there, incorporation of assessment and feedback opportunities, aligning with the red section, and then being really deliberate about using information to make adjustments to advance medical knowledge and clinical skills, which is represented in the yellow portion of the circle. Dr. Cotrea and colleagues propose an integrated process that the master adaptive learner would move in and out of to learn and practice. And throughout this entire cycle, self-regulation and reflection are necessary in order for the learner to take responsibility for their own learning and understand whether the learning is effective. And of course, in this model, learners can include med students, trainees, as well as the supervisors themselves. So that more than anything is the takeaway for faculty development. This mindset of growth, building upon iterative improvements, and fostering an adaptive approach to honing our expertise and proficiencies while embracing a shared learning experience. Next slide, please. I wanna be mindful of time and just say, I put this up here just to remind us of the um, ACGME competencies that we need to align our knowledge, skills, and attitudes with. And also to highlight that, as already been mentioned, there has been good work done to develop telehealth competencies across the learning continuum and the AAMC uh, just published their recent report, which I strongly encourage you to um, check out. Next slide, please. So as we draw from the learning models, the situational considerations and the emerging competencies within telemedicine, it can be helpful to reference one or more of these four quadrants. And I'm not going to belabor this any, um, any further because I want there to be a little bit of time for Q&A. But basically, whenever you're trying to make something better, as Dr. Jenkins has um, already mentioned, or if you're stuck and want to burst out, out, think about pulling one of these levers. Next slide. Here's a list of some of the immediate needs and priorities. Quite a list. And one of the reasons that I would really regret it if I didn't seize this opportunity to learn from you and ask you to share how you are addressing the four quadrants within your telemedicine educational encounters. So I'm gonna role model what Dr. Van Eck was just sharing, this back channel affordance that virtual technology provides us. I've created a virtual bulletin board that we can use to post current practices or not yet implemented ideas, specifically as they relate to how to prepare and support our preceptors and supervisors as they teach, observe, assess, and provide feedback and service role models within the telemedicine teaching and learning environment. So here is where I'm asking you to share your uh, novel ideas and best practices. I've put the link in the chat and I will now hand it over to Dr. Maya Hamoud, who will facilitate the Q&A portion of this session. Thank you uh, to all our presenters. There's so much information, a lot to digest. Um, and before we do the questions, a couple of uh, 
because it actually does kind of dovetail on some of the questions were asked. Uh, next slide, please. There are a couple of AMA opportunities that for people who are interested more in those the AMA telehealth uh, immersion program um, that um, you can uh, look look to because there are a lot of the questions that were asked. Actually, some of those answers are in here. Next slide, and specifically, there's a webinar uh, that's coming up on August 10 about how do you actually uh, implement innovative solution with an equity lens, which we think is really important for uh, telehealth uh, implementation. Um, you can take the slides down, um, Tyler, and I would like to ask all our presenters to come back. We have about five minutes for Q&A. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, if you don't mind turning your videos back on, and I think what I'm gonna try to do is um, try to ask you the questions and then as many as possible, and if you can be uh, efficient in, in uh, answering the question, that'd be great. And um, Dr. Billings, I'll start with you uh, as you're thinking about um, the assessment and the faculty development. Do you think that the professionalism standards are different for the same or in virtual encounter versus in-person encounters? It's an easy question for you to start with. <laughs> that, that is a great question. And I'm gonna say no, the professionalism standards should not be different um, based on the environment they may um, manifest themselves a little bit different, but the outcome or the demonstration of them should not be different. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Mishra. As a clinician and you went through the workflow and how does that affect your work? Uh, there've been multiple questions, both the pre-webinar and during the webinar now about how you know people don't get paid for teaching most of the time. And, uh, and then uh, as uh, Dr. Billings mentioned, we're all trying to learn it ourselves probably. How do you actually, um, uh, what do you do for train, how, what kind of, um, uh, what kind of incentive can you give to your clinicians to actually incorporate them more into providing um, telehealth teaching uh, to the learners? I, I think uh, this is a great question. I think this is a question of a system overall in terms of what is incentivized versus not incentivized. And I think uh, overall what we have seen through the progression initially after we had our students removed from the learning environment and now coming back with telehealth and in person, uh, I think the work which is required by the students and the preceptors is actually uh, about the same or actually lower in telehealth visit as well. So. I think the answer remains that we need to incentivize our providers and our physicians so that they can take more clinical uh, preceptors and teach students as well. And I think it depends on each other institution and our institution does have some of the, what we call it the uh, educational or arts money, uh, which is provided to our providers. So I'm hoping that um, nationally there, there, there is some standards there as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, the next question is for you. There was a question about, and, and from a learner perspective, when do you start teaching this? I think it should start right away. Can it wait? Uh, because we do hear different opinions about that. I, I think that's a great question. I mean, my totally uh, uh, unbiased personal perspective was that uh, diving into uh, virtual primary care as a resident, having never done live telemedicine encounters in you know month, 18 or you know, 20 of my residency was a nightmare and everybody else was unfamiliar with it too. And it was, it was really challenging. Now that was a unique situation, I think, in which the entire system was turned on its head. But I think we've demonstrated or the, you know, the, the industry has demonstrated that telemedicine is a, is a separate area of practicing medicine that warrants its own dedicated training experience. And if you see this as a competency, as a fundamental competency of being a physician, and we're using it across all fields and subspecialties, then I think introducing it and, and at least um, building a foundation on which skills can be built early on, rather than seeing it as the same thing as the in-person encounter, I think really would facilitate gathering of those skills over time. And no, I don't think that first year is too early. I would I would start early and, and you know either from a basic science perspective or clinical experiences. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vanek, the next question is for you, since you've been teaching um, students how to do this way before telemedicine became uh, fashionable. Uh, I, do you think that, that a, a learner should be engaged in in-person care de delivery or experience before actually you engage them in virtual care? Wow, that is a great question. Um, 
I think so, uh, but I, I want to I want to qualify it by saying that um, there's no one right way to do all of this. A lot of this really comes down to what do you have the capacity to do? What are your resources? What is your situation? Where are your students? When are your students? All of this starts from an environmental analysis and needs analysis and so forth. But having said that, uh, I think it is important to start with the uh, face to face because the technology adds a cognitive load and you kind of have to know what you're giving up with the technology and also what you're gaining. So the only way to do that is to have a really solid fundamental understanding of the basics. You need to know what a good history and physical would be before you can start trying to do things over telehealth and know what you're actually missing. If you don't know what you're missing, that's where the real problems come in, right? It's that what Dr. Billings was referring to is that unconscious incompetence. You don't know now what it is you don't know and you're gonna miss something. So yes, and I think you can you can do those things back and forth. I think you can teach them in person and then you could go right into some virtual and do a little bit here, a little bit there. Depends on what your resources and environment allow, but you should, before you're doing it, you should definitely have a solid foundation in the face-to-face. Well, thank you all. I want to be respectful of all your times. Again, thank you so much for all the great information. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We tried to get to a lot of them. And uh, I appreciate everybody who attended and stayed with us. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, we will send you information, the recording, the slides, as well as contact information if you wanted to ask uh, a particular speaker a question. I saw that because a question in the chat. So we'll make sure to do that. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, and have a wonderful evening.